Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute present The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. If you like us, please help us by subscribing and by reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might listen. And don't forget to sign up for weekly updates and study questions at formedbookclub.ignatius.com. Welcome to the Catholic Book Club with myself, Father Fessio, Vivian Dudro, and Joseph Pierce. We are continuing our discussion of Cardinal Zen's book, For Love of My People, I Will Not Remain Silent. Uh, we're getting into these three chapters of three, four, and five into quite a bit of detail. Uh, but I think there's some important things to draw from this, which we can discuss. One uh, is that the church is very human. It's divinely instituted by Christ, but made of a people like ourselves. And so we should not be surprised to see factions, intrigue, uh, various human elements intervening here in what is a divine project. And we see that clearly here in this book. Secondly, it seems to me that this document is another one of the legacies of Pope Benedict. Uh, it shows how he goes about a document like this, consulting with others, listening to them, organizing uh, their comments and putting it into kind of a structure uh, and therefore something which is of lasting value. I think this document uh, on the church in China ought to be the touchstone by which we evaluate our own attitudes towards what happens in China and the church's activities there and how we should look at the underground church and the official church. So with that little uh, preparation. Let's jump into. May I make a prefatory yes. remark? Yes. Oh, absolutely. And that is, you see in a in this book, just how important words really are. Oh yes. Words are important, and laboring over them is a worthwhile enterprise to try to get them clear and true and on the mark. And uh, what we see at work here is, is, how, is how difficult that can be. Yes, and on that topic, too, you know, the title is For Love of My People. And certainly Cardinal Zen, uh, who is quite old now and was at the time, uh, put a lot of effort, uh, time and energy into going over the text carefully and then writing his comments and making sure the Pope saw them and precisely so the words would be something that were not deceptive or overly ambiguous or misleading to make sure that what was said was corresponding to the reality as, as best as possible. Yeah, and, and also as a corollary to that, of course, the issue of translation. Because when you, when you change from one set of words to another set of words, uh, there's already a problem. And then if, there's a, if there are some shenanigans in the background, where the, the actual translation process is being used deliberately to distort the original document, then obviously you have all sorts of problems. And a large part of this book addresses those shenanigans. And there's a, there's a well-known Italian expression, traditore, traditore. Traditore means translator. Traditore means traitor. So you, you, you can't translate uh, without at least the danger of betraying the original text. Uh, I, I admire, for example, in Germany, uh, the, they have a translation of Shakespeare, which itself has become famous as German literature, because whoever did it, I don't know who it was that did it, was so capable as a translator that he took someone like Shakespeare, uh, you think about all the nuances and the different kind of words and the what are, to us are archaisms, and to put that in, ger in the German that that is really German and it really Shakespeare. That is that that is quite a talent. Yeah, it I is, think it, Shakespeare sorry. invented something like two thousand words, and so yeah, I, 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 I don't know. possibly. I mean, if 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 the uh, if the earliest known use that we that survives is Shakespeare's, it doesn't necessarily mean he invented the word. It just means that we have no 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 extant documents prior to 
that of the word being used. Just as that's little. a very good point. But his his word play is so masterful. The way he can use something to mean multiple things at the same time, and that would be so hard to to transfer to another language. Well, the 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 the, the issue is, I and mean, for instance, Roy Campbell's a masterful translator of poetry, the poetry of John of the Cross, for instance. But you have to make a choice: do you make a literal translation and destroy the the poetry? Or do you make a poet, poetic translation without actually destroying the meaning uh, and trying to maintain, maintain as much of the meaning? But of course, with this, which is a very much a non-fictional, non-poetic document that's just trying to convey uh, hard facts, um, it shouldn't really be as difficult to, uh, to not betray the meaning of the original. I just want to pursue the uh, excursus a little further. Uh, I know there's in many translations of Dante's Divine Comedy, and our good friend Anthony Esselin has done a recent one, which is highly praised. But I still like to go back to Dorothy Sayers' translation. First of all, her notes are marvelous. I mean, if you want to get Catholic theology, read the notes of Dorothy Sayers to her yes. edition of Divine Comedy. But she attempted a difficult task of Tertsurima, of making it, you know, using the same meter and the same rhyme structure uh, as uh, Dante did. And I, I don't know, I thought she did a pretty good job of it. But, uh, but well, all think, the... If we're, gonna, if we're going to continue, then I, I do actually, that's why it's my favorite, because I think that the form of the poem is an important part of what it, what, what it is, its structure. And if you lose the, uh, the Tetsurima uh, rhyme scheme, you actually lose a large part of, because it's like a chain that holds the whole thing together. Um, of course, you know, the argument is it's difficult, much more difficult to translate words in English than it is in Italian, and therefore some of the rhymes are forced. But I think that's a price worth paying. But of course, this is up for argument. Yes. Vivian? I was going to say what Joseph said about what the argument is, is when I was in a Dante seminar for three years with linguists and, and people much brighter and more educated than I, uh, that's what they said, was that Dorothy Dayer, uh, Sayers, in some cases, to force the rhyme, what got sacrificed was, was the meaning. So I think that the best way to go then is to read that and another translation. In the course of this seminar, we read three different translations, and each one of them has its own strengths. Uh, so and, and to go and to go and to go one step further, <laughs> the best, of course, would be to learn Italian. And, yeah. And, yes. And, yeah. And I and I met actually Barbara Reynolds, a uh, friend of Dorothy L. Sayers, when I was doing my research for my book on literary converts. And she's the person who actually finished translating Paradise after Dorothy L. Sayers had gone there, so to speak, after she died. Um, so she knows the poem very well, and she also was the editor of the Collins uh, Italian English Dictionary, so she knows Italian very well. And I said, it must be difficult, though, because it's you know, Dante's Italian, you know, it's a bit like Chaucer's English. And she said no, because no. the Italian language has actually changed much less uh, since medieval times than has English. She said that a better analogy would be Shakespeare, even though Shakespeare was born you know, 250 or so years later. That's right. Dante is the father of modern Italian. And one of the people in our groups was actually an Italian woman uh, with a, a literature background. And, you know, to, to read works like this, I just encourage all you listeners out there, any chance you get to read a work of something with people who really know the material, love the material, have way more knowledge than you do. It's such an enriching experience. You've got, to, you've got to love a book club where we are ostensibly discussing China and somehow we got into the Divine Comedy, but there you go. That's Yeah, part there of the you go. Well, and then, you know, that Tolkien and Lewis together and with their friends, I mean, at least Tolkien, uh, he learned Norse. I think Lewis, too. They learned Norse so they could read the Edda in the original language. But, I mean, of course, uh, we can't imitate them <laughs> easily. So let, let, let's go from... Uh, Italy to China here. Uh, the chapter three has to do with the the draft and the suggestions and, and the Chinese translation. What I was impressed by in this chapter was that uh, Cardinal Zen went over the draft very carefully, and he then submitted that to the Pope. And then when the document came out, he went back to look and see what was I listened to, you know, and he was very pleased to see that he was. And I can relate this to my personal experience. I was in seminars with then Professor Ratzinger. 
eight or 10 of us doctoral students sitting around a table. And uh, he was very passive in a sense. He would uh, listen to us all. We'd be kind of arguing back and forth and making presentations. He would always make sure that everybody spoke. Uh, and because my German was very poor and uh, you know how shy I am, he would often have to call on me. I'd say something. But at the end of the seminar, he'd kind of sit back and kind of look above us all and compose two or three sentences, which gathered together all the important, you know, statements that were made, organized them properly, put them in kind of an order. Uh, and it was a beautiful summary. And I, I can see Pope Benny doing the same thing. He has his committee. He has Cardinal Zen. He listens to them all. But then he makes a decision. He makes a discernment of what should be emphasized, what should not be emphasized, what should be said, what should not be said. So I, I see this as a little window into the procedure, the method of a wonderful pope who himself towers above almost everybody else intellectually, and yet is so humble that he listens to everyone else and then puts, you know, puts it together in a, in a synthetic way. Of course, part of, I, think, part, of my, part of my think his great talent is that he's read some, he, he's read the fathers of the church, you know, he's read the great authors, he's read literature, he's listened to music. He, he already has let himself be enriched by so many different people and points of view. Go ahead, Joseph. Yeah, I'm just saying that, um, that the, I agree with you completely that uh, Pope Benedict uh, shines forth as a, a hero in this whole process, um, but we do see, of course, the politics of the Vatican, uh, and there are ways where the Pope's being circumvented by by the Curia on occasions, and I think that is that has included tampering with the translation. Right. Well, an, an example uh, of this uh, mischief, which <laughs> is the exact opposite of what Father just described, Benedict did was the deliberations of that commission for the church in China that when they met in these meetings, this is spelled out in chapter four, you know, they, um, they already had the agenda. They already had the, the documents that they were supposed to read. They already had the, um, you know, so the, the difference between the people who are in search of truth, which is what I would put Benedict, the camp I would put Benedict in, and the people who are in search of power and are going to try to manipulate the outcome of deliberations in a certain way so they get the results they want. And there are all these stratagems for doing this, including the pre-planning of these meetings and how you control what way the direction goes. And you see both things operative in this little book here, the search for truth versus the search for power. And to me, it's just an eye-popping little, uh, like, uh, a bird's eye view, not a bird's eye view, that's from far away, but a, a little view of, 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 of a slice of experience that happens in lots of different places. And uh, you can g gain wisdom for how the whole thing works by reading a little slice like this. And Carter Zent talks about the manipulation of the translation of the Pope's letter. That's actually a quote on page 64 um and uh you know this is that what i said what i call shenanigans i don't know what shenanigans has anything to do with china china but there, there we are um and again you know at, at meetings there was actually a vote taken at a meeting that was just ignored yes uh, you know uh nothing that was not acted upon right that's right it uh, of course like all things is complex and uh it's not just a division among those who search for truth and those who search for power. If you really believe something, you want to persuade. If you can't persuade, you want to impose. I mean, that's, that's right. what that's you do. Right. And I'm thinking about in the Second Vatican Council, when it was prepared, it was the Roman Curia who prepared the original documents. And they were prepared basically on the foundation of a, a particular school of thought that was very dominant in many places, but was incomplete was not Catholic in the in the small c sense. And so it was people like Ratzinger who was there as a young theologian and others who objected to that and the bishops they were counseling also objected. And so there was a revision of those founding uh, preparatory documents. Now, 
they also kind of went too far in some cases, and the council had some ambiguities in it, which are regrettable. Nevertheless, those, Carlo Taviani and the others, it wasn't that they wanted power for itself, but they thought that for the good of the church, it was important to fend off some of these uh, more current or more contemporary theological speculations to protect the church. So I don't, I don't entirely blame those who uh, seek to use their position of power in order to make their view successful, because at least some of them, I believe, have uh, altruistic motives, I mean, for the good of the church. As long as we're not using uh, immoral means to the good end, and, that, and that's, uh, that's, of course, the, the, the defining matter here, whether some of this manipulation of the translation was, was uh, tantamount effectively to distortion and lies. I mean, that, at that point, even, even were we to assume that the pro-Chinese Communist Party, uh, uh, well, not, let's not go too far, those that, those that want the official church to be officially recognized um, uh, and some sort of uh, agreement come to between the Vatican and the, and the Chinese Communist Party, even were we to assume that that was a noble end, which of course is another matter, uh, you know, the, 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 the immoral means to achieve that end are nonetheless uh, reprehensible. Yes, especially when the Pope has decided and it's, it's, the official text is there, and then to intentionally water it down or leave things out or, or change it, that is reprehensible. Uh, and Oh, I had a brilliant thing I was going to say, but I forgot it now. How about that? <laughs> well, you know, um, what's another great thing about this little book is that there is this sort of meta narrative, if you will, going on. So we see these power plays. We see these people, good intentions, some maybe not so good, all these things going on. All the while, the very Pope, in this drama is Benedict, who himself has dedicated his life to truth and defending of truth. And on page 90, we have Cardinal Zen exploring Benedict's expression, dictatorship of relativism. I just thought, I, I know I'm jumping way ahead in our section, but it seems to fit what we're talking about. This expression, dictatorship of relativism is his, meaning Benedict's. Someone might say, can't the truth of faith be dictatorial? At first glance, it may seem so, but upon reflection, we see that this way of thinking is wrong. If there are only personal points of view, who will be able to impose this point of view? The rich and the powerful, naturally. Conversely, if we recognize the existence of objective truth, everyone is equal before it. Human rights were born with man, not granted by the rich and powerful. Defending this objective truth, Guarding that treasure of wisdom is precisely the task of the church. Well, it was precisely the task of Benedict in this very concrete example of fighting for the truth vis-a-vis -vis what truly is the situation of Catholics in China and how does the church best go about defending those souls who are struggling to live the Christian faith under a hostile uh, totalitarian regime. Yeah, and... and, and this man of truth was the man of the hour in this in this particular episode to me is not an accident uh, yeah and, and uh, if we can go back a little bit for I'm glad you highlighted that particular passage though which is which is superb but on page 74 Cardinal Zen is at pains when talking about the compendium the sort of summary of the letter that it, it is right at the top of page 74 especially important uh, to highlight the difference between reconciliation, which is at the level of minds, and unification, which instead concerns structures. And then he says in the next paragraph, Father Hendricks and others insisted on unification right away, while the Pope spoke of reconciliation, and said that unification is a long and hard road that will also require the government's goodwill. So to seek reconciliation, which is bringing together a, a concord of minds, uh, is a good thing. Um, but that unification uh, is not the same thing as reconciliation. Uh, and, 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 and as Cardinal said, says here, obviously the Pope stressed the difference between the two and was pursuing reconciliation before we could even talk about anything uh, approaching unification. I think there's a... 
a little trope that might help here. I won't go so far as to say the world is divided into two classes of people, pioneers and settlers, but there nevertheless is among leaders, uh, you know, a, a tendency towards one or the other of those kinds of temperaments. So when you look at the history of the early of the church in early America, you have these bishops who are out riding horseback, you know, and and they're tough and they make decisions. They, they stand by them and they, they listen to other people, but uh, there's no shilly shallying. There's no trying to please someone. They, they're going to do the, do the job, you know, because once, once they've established the diocese and it grows up, who becomes the next bishop? Not the one who's the fearless leader who doesn't care about what people think, but the people who make the most friends. I mean, the ones who are trying to conciliate or, uh, you know, be approved by everyone, make friends. And we see this in China. I mean, you have people like Cardinal Zen and others. I mean, they fought for the faith. I mean, they're, they're, they're not into compromise. They're into fighting and dying for the faith. You come back to the Roman Curia, how those people get there? They got there because they made friends, you know, with all factions that, that they didn't have enemies. Uh, I, this is, you know, maybe making it too simplified. Nevertheless, there's a truth to it that you got Cardinal Sen. He's a pioneer. And he's someone who's courageous and wanting to be a martyr. You got good people in the Vatican. They want let's, let's just all get along. Can we just discuss this and get all get along? They don't understand, right. you know, situation on the ground. But yeah, and I, I, I agree with that. But you, I mean, again, on page seventy-five, though, we see the politics here because uh, as uh, just to read that paragraph, the top half of the page. As we got ready to discuss the content of the compendium, the secretaries of the Curia came along to say that they planned to submit another booklet as a way to make the letter more widely known. Uh, at that point, I said that I too would prepare another booklet, one entitled An Aid to Reading the Holy Father's Letter to the Church in China. When they took a look at my aid, they said they would drop their booklet, hoping perhaps that I too would drop mine. That's what I did. However, I also said that I would not publish it in the name of the committee, but in mine. So basically, quite clearly, you know, the explanation that was being planned by uh, these secretaries of the Curia was uh, going to be very different in tone and, and indeed, I wouldn't, one would suspect, purpose than, uh, than the Cardinal Zen's. And Cardinal Zen was wily enough to know that. And he said, OK, you write yours, I'll write mine. And yeah. when they read his, they said, well, let's just drop the whole, the whole thing, right? And uh, that he backfired because he dropped it as an official document, but just published in his own name. Uh, so this is an example, I think, of an, an effort to confuse and confute the meaning of the Pope's letter backfiring because of the wiliness and holiness of Cardinal Zen. But Joseph, don't you understand, they wanted to promote the spirit of the letter. <laughs> <laughs> Father, to your point, uh, about these different kinds of men. And I suppose in God's wisdom, he's made them all because it takes all kinds to make the world go round. But there's this, I wish I could find where it is now. There's this scene where um, this issue of these illegitimate bishops who are valid, by the way, this is a very interesting thing that you can be valid and illegitimate at the same time. Uh, and, and, this pressure that there's there's tremendous pressure being exerted on the bishops of China by the government to go along with the government control of the church, even at risk of cutting off communion with the Holy See, which then would no longer be the Catholic Church, right? So there's this terrible uh, tension here. But many of these men under pressure by the regime do what the regime asks. And there's a scene in here somewhere where one of these men, bishops in China, who went along with the government. Yeah, page, that's page 60, the Bao Ding case. Is it page 60? The and Bao then, Ding case. And so then here there are some, you know, trying to exhort these men, hold the line, don't give in, don't capitulate. And then he gets to Rome and the diplomatic people in Rome say, well, we understand, yeah. right? So you've got the Cardinal Zen types trying to exhort these bishops in China to hold the line at the cost of their lives, perhaps, or maybe 25 years in a prison or whatever. And they get to Rome and they're told, 
we understand you need to do what you need to do. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that those men in Rome who are saying that are bad men. They, it, does mean, I mean, it, it does mean that they're mistaken, though. And again, if, if we can, if we can um, look at page 77, we see how Pope Benedict again, again comes through uh, with uh, flying colors in, in, in this uh, difference of approach towards the, uh, the church in China. So again, uh, but towards the bottom of page 77, the fact is that many bishops and priests took part in the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the first illegitimate Episcopal ordination as if the Pope's letter had never been written. And, and during the meeting with the Pope, with Cardinal Petoni present, I said, it is all the fault of Ostpolitik. The willingness on the part of the Holy See to yield, yield has encouraged the Chinese government to be more and more arrogant. At that point, Pope Benedict told Cardinal Bertone, do you remember, with respect to Ostpolitik, John Paul II said, enough. Yes, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I mean, related that. Yes, yeah. John Paul II's approach to the Soviet Union, uh, to Soviet communism, was not, let, yeah, that's okay, let's get along. Uh, and, he, and, was, what, was, and why do you think, what was the difference between his experience and the experience of those in the Curia? Precisely. Right. He, he, he lived under it. By yeah, the way, can, can, can either of you name two bishops at the time of Henry VIII, two Catholic bishops? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yes, well, Thomas Cranmer was made a bishop, of course, by Henry VIII. But if you're talking about legitimate bishops as opposed to illegitimately ordained ones, which makes it very appropriate this discussion, I can only think at a moment of St. John Fisher, but I'm sure... Exactly, and yeah, that's yeah. the only one anyone can think of. Right. And why is that? Because he was the Cardinal Zen of yes. 1535, you know? Yes, right. absolutely. That's absolutely. right. Well, you know, this, this, um, I'm so glad you highlighted that, Joseph. I did too. And, you know, this, the willingness to yield encourages the other side to become more arrogant. Meaning, if the other side does not have goodwill, no amount of your showing your goodwill uh, changes anything. Well, let's remember the words of Lenin. I mean, it's very appropriate under the circumstances. Lenin said, advance on all fronts. When you encounter steel, withdraw. Where you encounter mush, advance. Well, let me, let me quote St. Ignatius of Loyola, and this will probably get our little session here removed from any platform we're on but he says in the special exercises the devil is like a woman uh the more you yield the more she will press forward but the more you resist the more she'll fall back <laughs> anyway depends on the woman i think uh, well or the man <laughs> <laughs> i'm the feisty type that the more you fight me the more i fight back okay. that's unfortunate well, that is a character defect of mine but nevertheless um yeah and again the conclusion of chapter four uh page 80 i cannot quite shake the conviction that the ost politic of the officials of the roman curia undermined all the efforts displayed by the commission to help the church in China. Yeah. Well, we, we saw what happened to us politic in term, terms of uh, Russia and the Soviet Union. Uh, nothing until there were three or four people who stood up, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, Pope John Paul II. Um, heroes of their time. Yeah, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, I'd add to that as well, to that illustrious list. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Any, uh, yeah. Sorry, please. Ch chapter five, the content, Catholic ecclesiology, any comments there? It's kind of a, he goes through, but the good thing he does is he goes through the letter and he kind of goes thematically, so not, not sequentially. And he, he both in, emphasizes both the structure of the church and the mission of the church, and how it cannot be the church unless it adheres to the truth that Christ has given us. So we can't we can't accept a false structure where some national government is going to be choosing our bishops. Yeah, he quotes the Pope 
Pope Benedict on page 85, paragraph 7.3, the Pope clearly states, quote, truth and charity are the two supporting pillars of the life of the Christian community. So you, you can't have uh, an absence of truth or an equivocating with truth in the name of charity, because uh, the, the, the two are as inseparable as, as faith and reason. Uh, you have to be truthful in order to be charitable. And that's Pope, Pope Benedict's motto was uh, cooperatoris in veritati, co-workers in the truth. That the truth isn't something that I possess or you possess, but we possess, especially within the church. And that's why someone like Benedict could stand firm because he was not promoting his own ideas. Uh, he was promoting what he knew was the deepest teaching of the church. Vivian, I cut you off. Yes, what I was most struck by on page, was, is on page 89, uh, where in the middle of the page there, faith is more fundamental than the sacraments. Under normal circumstances, we must treasure the sacraments because they are, they are the most effective means of receiving God's grace. But if extraordinary circumstances should prevent the sacraments from being received, the Lord has a thousand ways to give his grace. And then he repeats it. Faith is more fundamental than the sacraments. And I, I suppose that the importance of this remark in this context is that if the Chinese government manages to hold the levers on Episcopal ordinations, then in a way they can hold people, uh, you know, they can hold the sacraments out as a as a carrot or the withdrawal of them as a stick to get people to get in line with the bishops they choose. And so while absolutely we should be grateful for the sacraments and so on, to realize that we're in that situation of to be true to Christ, I have to remain hidden. And that might mean I remain underground and away from the above ground sacraments that are being offered through these illegitimate bishops. You know, maybe in conscience that I have to make this terrible choice, which uh, we, uh, we we kind of went through a little bit of this with COVID, actually. I could just going to say, imagine, yes. If this were actually the policy of our government to try to use the sacraments to lure us out of hiding, even though we know that it's 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 uh, anyway, I, I was really struck by that. Yes. And then I think I think it was Japan. Uh, where for more than two centuries, uh, you know, after the Jesuits were expelled in the time of St. Francis Xavier, when the missionaries came back, they found Catholic families who would ask them, do you believe in the Eucharist? Do you believe in the Pope? Do you believe in Mary? And when they said, yes, okay, we can follow you. But so the, and so the faith, right. the faith was kept years without the they had, For yeah. 200 years, they had no Eucharist. That's they right. have the sacrament of baptism because that can be administered by lay people. Right. They had the sacrament of matrimony because that can be administered by husband and wife to each other. And they kept those two sacraments alive for 200 years. I mean, that's astonishing. It is. Well, I think uh, that's been a good discussion. We'll conclude this book next week with chapters six, seven, and eight. And after that, Get your copy, if you don't already have it yet, of In Defense of Sanity by G.K. Chesterton. This will be uh, an exciting book. It may take us some time to get through it because with Chesterton, there's always a lot of things to discuss, and it's kind of a long book. Any concluding comments or remarks? Or are we done for this time? I think we've pretty much covered it. All right. Thanks, everyone. God bless you all. See you next week on the Forum Book Club. If you enjoyed this discussion, please help spread the word about the Forum Book Club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review. You can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com.